Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we are going over the Emergency Severity Index and providing triage tips for new ER nurses. Thank you for your time. So, what is triage? It's the process of sorting patients based on how ill they are with the goal of prioritizing patients who are more critical so that these patients receive interventions first. As you are aware, staffing and resources are often limited in the ER. Triage helps us use our limited resources more effectively. So triage occurs in the pre-hospital setting and in the ER. In the pre-hospital setting, EMS decides where and how to transport patients based on their needs. In the ER, triage can occur in the designated triage area where patients are seen after they walk into the ER or in each individual room after they're brought in by ambulance. So the, sever the emergency severity index is a five level triage algorithm, algorithm ranging from again, one to five with level one being the most acute, most ill patient. So again, it's a five level triage algorithm used to prioritize patients in the emergency department based on the acuity of their condition and the anticipated resources needed. Again, this anticipated resources needed is very important. We'll cover what the resources are shortly. So for an ESI level one, it's known as immediate. It is assigned to patients with life-threatening conditions requiring immediate interventions. These patients should be seen immediately and will need many, many resources. Examples of ESI level ones can include cardiac and respiratory arrest, severe trauma, severe burns, active severe hemorrhage and acute myocardial infarction. The key is that these patients need to be seen immediately and be placed on a higher priority than all other patients in the ER. Now, an ESI level two is known as emergent. It is assigned to patients with potentially life-threatening conditions. These patients are unstable and may deteriorate without prompt medical attention. These patients should be seen by a provider within 10 minutes. Examples can include chest pain with suspected ACS, an asthma exacerbation, moderate trauma, or even stroke-like symptoms. The key is that these patients will have unstable vital signs and or have a time-sensitive issue that need prioritization above other patients to prevent further deterioration. Again, these patients must, must be seen within 10 minutes of arrival and will also use, again, many resources. And we'll cover what the resources are in a little bit. Now, for an ESI level three, it's known as, they're known as urgent patients. It's assigned to patients with stable vital signs who do not require prompt, who do, I'm sorry, who do require prompt assessment and interventions, but their condition is not life-threatening at this moment. Again, these patients should be seen somewhere within 30 minutes. Examples can include abdominal pain, syncope or near syncope, exacerbation of a chronic issue like asthma or COPD without changes in their vital signs, possible fractures, skin infections like cellulitis. Again, these patients with an ASI, ESI level of three, they're, they're stable, but they do require two or more resources to diagnose and treat their condition. These patients should be seen within 30 minutes again. Now, for an ESI level four, they're known as less urgent. It's assigned to very stable patients who can wait for an hour or longer. These patients do not have life-threatening conditions. Examples can include lacerations, requiring sutures, sprains or strains, UTIs, minor burns, and mild pain. These patients will only require one resource. And now, for level five, these are known as non-urgent patients. It, it is assigned to patients who do not require immediate attention, have no life-threatening conditions, and may wait for an extended period of time. Examples can include cold symptoms, work notes, medication refills, and even suture removal. These patients do not require any resources and are able to wait for an extended period of time. So now, what does count as a resource? Resources refers to diagnostic tests and treatments. Again, resources refers to diagnostic tests and treatments. 
Included can, can be laboratory studies such as blood work and urine, imaging studies such as x-ray, CT, ultrasound, or MRI, medications such as IV meds, IM meds, and subcutaneous medications. Here, it's important to know that oral medications typically do not count as a resource. Other resources include IV fluids such as normal saline or lactator ringers, and even consultations such as cardiology or ortho. Procedures also count such as a laceration repair or an incision and drainage, or more complex procedures like chest tube placement, central lines, A lines, and even reductions. Now, what does not count as a resource? Typically, oral medications do not count as a research. Medication refills point of care glucose testing, simple wound dressings, assessments like a history and physical and suture removal do not count as a resource. So how do you go about selecting the appropriate ESI score for a patient? Some of the questions that you can ask yourself is after you've done your assessment, you got a history, you got a set of vital signs, you ask yourself, is this patient dying, right? If the answer is yes, they're an ESI of one. For example, is this patient not breathing? Are they severely hypoxic? Do they have a pulse? Are they hypotensive, but it's also accompanied with signs of poor tissue perfusion, like decreased mentation, they're pale, diaphoretic, and so forth? Those would be an ESI of one. Also, if they need life-saving intervention, such as like intubation, defibrillation, cardioversion, needle decompression, or even PCI, if so, these are going to be ESIs of one because they need to be prioritized above all other patients, right? Because they're dying. Now, if they're not dying, are they unstable to the point where they should not wait in the lobby? or do they have a time sensitive issue? If the answer is yes, then they should be an ESI of two. For example, are they experiencing signs of a stroke? Is it a newborn with a fever? Or an immunocompromised cancer patient with infection symptoms? Are they suicidal? Is it a short of breath asthmatic patient that is tachypnic and satting 91%? Or another example can be a patient endorsing uh, vomiting blood who is also tachycardic and hypotensive in the 90s, but they're still oriented, they're still maintaining. What helps me differentiate and determine the difference between ESI level 1 and, and 2 is asking whether they're dying right now. If they're not dying, then they're in ESI 2 because they're still unstable. Now, to differentiate between an ESI 2 and an ESI 3, what helps me figure this out is if I ask myself, would I be comfortable with this patient going back to the lobby and, and or should they get my last bed in the ER? If I don't feel comfortable with them going back to the lobby because of a vital sign or just something is time sensitive and they should, I think they should take the last bed, they're most likely in ESI level 2. Now, when it comes to the ESIs level three, four, and five, this is where we need to focus on the resources. An ESI level of three patient will require two or more resources as they have a complaint that will require an in-depth evaluation, but they're deemed stable and they're safe to wait for a bit. An ESI level four will only require one resource and an ESI level five will require no resources, right? So remember, these are what count as resources lab studies imaging studies most medications iv fluids consultations and procedures so you got to be mindful of these when you're looking at the esi levels three four and five now let's go into specific nursing tips when it comes to triage you have to advocate for yourself you should not be in the triage area if you do not have at least one year of experience ideally two Although we have the ESI and protocols in place, a huge part of keeping patients safe in triage comes from experience. You should have a solid foundation in clinical skills, critical thinking, and patient assessments, as these are essential for making accurate decisions. Experience helps you recognize when patients are at high risk for deteriorating. With experience also comes confidence. Often, with high senses in the ER, there aren't many open beds. And if your patient needs a bed, you need to confidently get your point across to the charge nurse as to why this patient you're calling for needs a bed, right? Another, another tip is always obtain an accurate weight for a pediatric patients. Medications uh, for peds are weight-based, so you need to have an accurate weight. Um, newborns with a fever are automatically an ESI of two. So anybody, any any kid under 28 years 
under 20 uh 28 days old they need to be and they have a favor they need to be an esi of two next uh connect everything for the vitals like the blood pressure the pulse ox everything you need while you're speaking to the patient so you can be more efficient so you don't do one and then the other do both at the same time and you need to always check a point of care glucose for diabetics other tips include that if you have a gut feeling that something is off or just the patient does not look right to you, get a second opinion, a buddy nurse, the charge, or even the provider. You can never be too safe. And with the time, you will get better and you will have a better grasp for things. But again, if something is off, trust it. But this is why experience to be out in triage is a must. With ESI's levels of 4 and 5, I let patients know that the wait times are going to be long and that we are doing our best but they do need to anticipate being in the ER for several hours. This helps a little with preventing patients from getting too irritable. You let them know early on that the wait is going to be long. Don't forget the mnemonic sample to help you to help guide your questions. It stands for signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last meal, and event of the situation. Again, know your organization's protocols for chest pain, for pediatric fevers, for possible fractures, for strokes, traumas, and nurse-initiated orders such as ordering a urinalysis for UTI symptoms. For example, your chest pain protocol, your hospital may indicate that you order an EKG, a chest x-ray, a troponin, a CBC, and a chemistry. And that's part of the protocol when a patient comes to triage. The pediatric protocol may say uh, that you get the accurate that you get the accurate weight and that you medicate this patient based on their weight for their fever, right? Keep it in mind things making sure that the that the parents didn't already give that medication before arrival. So make sure you know your organization's protocol. And here, if you would like to continue learning and master the basics of emergency nursing, check out our books on Amazon. With the view inside option, you can take a look at the table of contents to see what is included in the book. Links are below. As always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.